thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. And I sent you all the, the forms and the questions we had. I kind of went over them a bit just to see if there's any last minute uh, concerns that people wanted to know from you. The one that I'd love to talk about first, which is kind of the most biggest broad concern barrel racers have, and that's just handling anxiety and nerves pre-barrel race. What would you recommend or say to those people that just seem to not be able to get a grasp on their anxiety before they run? Well, the one thing I always like to remind people is that they're not alone in this. I think when we get nervous, we think we're the only one and we're the, what's wrong with me, right? And we start judging ourselves that we've got, um, we have something wrong with us because we are nervous and we have all this anxiety beforehand and you're not alone. Remember that, right? But then also to start looking at where is this coming from? Why am I getting taken away with my energy? And it can come from different sources or different reasons. Um, a lot of the time, like some of the reasons is if people start associating their results in the arena with their self-worth. So mm -hmm. if they're not showing up with a strong sense of worth before they get there, they're putting a lot of pressure on themselves to show up and prove themselves or do something in the arena. Mm -hmm. Because, and then when it doesn't turn out, then they've measured themselves against that. And something, one thing I took home from, I attended several Judy Millimacki clinics and one of the things that like really hit home for me was like, girl racing is just what you do, not who you are. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that's not really going to resonate with them. And then other people, it's going to be like, oh my goodness, I've been doing that. I've been trying to be a barrel racer. And I think that what I do in the arena is going to make me one. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work that way. Who you are, it, it, your, your self-worth is not dictated by your, and should not be dictated by your performance in the arena. It's completely separate. So that goes into a, another part, which is a big area in my work, is the feeling of enoughness. Mm -hmm. Like, I am enough, mm -hmm. just as I am. It's connected to that, right? Like, your self-worth in the arena. But like, that I am enough. It doesn't matter if my horse goes in there and runs up the wall, it doesn't matter if I win. It doesn't change who I am. I just am enough as I am, win or learn, mm -hmm. as I like to say, right? Because you're never losing. If You're only losing if you didn't take the lesson from whatever happened up there. Absolutely. I love that. And then you're able to kind of, it. that just would kind of almost relieve all that stress off your shoulders if you thought about that. Like, no matter what happens, you already know the outcome is a little irrelevant. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, it's not abnormal for, and especially like if you're, if, if you're, you know, I started barrel racing when I was, I don't like preteen probably. Right. So like that impressionable time where you want people to uh, like you and recognize you and like you want to fit in so badly. And then what that just starts being part of barrel racing even though it's kind of a stage in life. Mm -hmm. And then when you don't let that go, I don't know like if you don't start, if you don't recognize that. And you know how I said, like this might resonate for some people and not others. My sister and I were at the same clinic when Judy had, she had like a little handout and that was on it. And my sister's almost 10 years younger than me. Um, she has a completely different set of like, pre-performance or post-performance issues than I do mm -hmm. and like that changed my life recognizing that I've been doing that and she was like what like no it's not like she just knew that so it's not a thing for everybody but I do see it as a big thing for uh -huh. a lot of people anyway yeah. connecting that yeah uh -huh. yeah just it's not who you are it's it's what you're doing but the results don't determine who you are as a person in the end right which for sure now no, I'm awesome no matter what yeah. And on the contrary, one question that we had is if you have a hard time actually getting excited for your run, but you might get too nervous. So it's like you, you do get nerves, but at the same time, you're almost too calm and relaxed. Do you have any recommendations for finding that balance of yeah, energy sure. and running, but also being focused and ready to compete well? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And I've actually, so I've experienced both ends of that spectrum and part of it, um, I had a horse help me get there. 
So I had like the one horse that was super nervous and I was super nervous. It was a bad combination. So then I got the horse that was super laid back and then that helped me bring my energy down too. So sometimes part of it might be the horse we're on that they're bringing us down, but yet we actually have to bring that energy level up. And I do, um, I experienced this when I first started grounding myself and learning about grounding. So it's like getting back into your body and I imagine roots growing into the ground. Well then, as it turned out, it was like I was dragging an anchor. Like we were just going in there all chill and zen and relaxed, mm -hmm. right? So then I added where I actually will ground from above and connect to, I imagine like a white beam of light coming from above that fills my body with I call it light force energy. And then I can bring it up as high as I need it to be, right? Mm -hmm. Or I can tone it down. So it's just actually, it's what I use in my imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Bring my energy up or down, mm -hmm. but you can just do it. But it's recognizing that you can manage your own energy. Like I can get super high energy right now if I want, and I can like really bring it. Mm -hmm. or I can just bring it down and relax because that other energy would be like, a little much right <laughs> but for some horses you have to bring it like that like you do have to get it up there but having the awareness of that like yeah you are gonna have to bring your energy up maybe you're gonna have to um, go and do some rollbacks off the wall and get those feet moving and get your blood moving with the horse and get amped up um, and then also like consider I think if you're not getting like a little bit nervous then you need to assess what's going on. Like, what are you not loving about what you're doing so much? Mm -hmm. Like to find that edge again. So that happened uh, to me with um, like a horse that I ran at the CCA finals and won the Manitoba championships with. Well, we just kind of just kept making the same run and making the same run and making the same run. And that sounds like a dream to somebody that that's all they've always wanted to do, right? Like, I just want consistency, but we had been doing it for years and years and years. And then I recognized it was time for me to get on a young horse mm -hmm. and find like, I needed more challenge. Yeah. So there's that, there's lots of areas to it, right? That could be contributing to why you're not feeling it. But when I learned about like bring how I could bring my energy up or how I could bring my energy down, it was actually on a young horse that was not consistent that was really laid back that I had to bring her energy up because she would love to just go and like boom, boom. Slope of pleasure <laughs> class. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. I like that. I like that visualization of you're kind of like rooting from down upward and yeah, yeah you have the control for it. Yeah. And is there ways, I guess you kind of mentioned that, but if you do get nervous, kind of ways that you can more or less embrace in a different way of, okay, well, if you're past the point of no return in your nerves and something's about to happen, is there like something you can quickly do to just, if your energy is too high and you feel it's unmanageable, is there ways to maybe bring it down like forcefully? Oh, well, okay. So the first thing that came to my mind when you were telling me that when you were asking this question was I would get off my horse and I would get my feet on the ground. Literally. Uh, yeah, like literally ground yourself by putting and it's like and I think of it as a reset. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just getting off, I'm gonna reset. And when you get on the ground, your horse is probably gonna have a big sigh because they're like, Oh my goodness, thank <laughs> thankfully she's off to me for a minute. And then I would then work on really um slowing your breath. Mm -hmm. Taking a deep breath, if you can, take that deep breath in through your nose. I just took it in through my mouth, but through your nose and then as slow as you can, releasing it out your mouth. Mm. Um, when, I don't know if you've ever been hooked up to like a heart rate monitor that goes on your finger, where I had like a huge awareness with, of this was I was going in for surgery and my finger was hooked up to the thing, you know, mm -hmm. and my heart's going like beep, 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 beep. I didn't really know. I didn't associate that with my heart. Like I didn't. And the nurse came in. She's like, Oh, are you really nervous? <laughs> I thought I was cool as a cucumber. Uh, yeah. She goes, try, try taking some deep breaths. So I took these deep breaths and my, the beep slowed like right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it is associated with our vagus nerve and our entire nervous system. We can shift it and, mm -hmm. and switch it just by taking those deep breaths. So it's a good thing to practice when you're not nervous too, mm -hmm. where you take that breath in through your nose and then out through your mouth and yeah. Yeah. just keep
you for that. And that's actually brings me to the other question that I was going to ask is doing things outside of the saddle that will kind of transition over to riding. Cause right now, obviously there's so much downtime. So it's like, what could we do now to help prepare ourselves to when shows start back up to feel ready and in that space again, really quickly. So I guess the breathing is definitely something like doing any sort of meditations. Is there anything else outside of the saddle that will help kind of with our performance and our mindset? Yeah, for sure. Um, even like watching your mindset and watching your thoughts and watching your judgments through this challenging time that we're all going through, this is, this is working on your mental toughness right now, right? Like it is, we're all going to end up coming out tougher from this. It, as long, as long as we practice those reframes and the shifts that we're always looking for the opportunity and this is an opportunity for us, right? To work on our mindset because we're not hauling down the road. We're not doing all the things. We're not running this and we're not running that. So working on visualizations, like if you, um, you know, there's been studies done that if you were actually hooked up to a bunch of machines or electrodes or whatever they plug you into and you imagine your run or your slalom skiing or whatever it is, your muscles will be twitching. Your brain is actually believes that it is doing whatever it is you're imagining. So, and as like, as geeky as it sounds, I did. So for in my stride coaching group right now, we're working on visualization. So I did the visual visualization while I'm recording it. And I was like, Oh, that was so fun. Like I, <laughs> you know, when you've been away from barrel racing for a while, when it gets you all giddy, like you just made this <laughs> But in my mind, like I made this great run and I felt it. And so when you are doing the visualizations, you want to use all your senses. Like, what does it smell like? Is it windy? Is it warm? How are you feeling? And you can just think about approaching the arena and they called your name. And like, even just me saying that, I can feel my nerve, like, I won't call them nerves, but my excitement level uh, comes up, right? Mm -hmm. That's a perspective shift. We can look at it as excitement instead of nervousness, mm -hmm. but you can totally get yourself there and while I was doing my own visualization I caught myself in a bad habit that I so on my way across the second barrel in my visualization I was looking down the inside of her neck and so you can also retrain your subconscious through these visualizations mm -hmm. and stop that from happening without having to having to ride your horse to do it not having to use them up right Mm -hmm. So this is where that stuff should be happening. And I thought that was pretty cool that it wasn't perfect so that I could fix it. Right. It give you an opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you are visualizing, you can, you don't have to do the whole run because that can, that's overwhelming. Like to could be overwhelming for somebody to be able to stay present and visualize the entire run. So you can just work on your line to first. You can just work on your, line between second and third or, or only the turn and then you can put it all together but you really want to be able to do like 10 times in a row the perfect run because really if you can't do it perfectly in your mind it's not going to happen in real life <laughs> the odds aren't that great like I don't expect to make a perfect run when I go to make a run anyway because that's not realistic and it's probably not going to be fast but um in your mind you're you you're training your subconscious to do what it needs to do when you go to make that run. Because, mm -hmm. and the other thing that um, is interesting is if you set a timer on your phone with the uh, 17, five, you want to run and mm -hmm. see how fast that actually is when you're trying to visualize it, you know, set the timer for that and then imagine your run and see where you're at it goes a lot faster and it's no wonder we can't do all the things right that we want to do when we're making a run. And that's why we need to train our subconscious to do it. So we don't have to think because that is also a thing that trips people up a lot is they have all these things that they want to remember to do in their run. And it's, it's not possible when you think of how fast no. it, the time goes. 100%. Yeah. So it has to be happening subconsciously. So we need that muscle memory as some people mm -hmm. call it. We need it trained and you can do that through visualization. And then the meditation, as you mentioned, that is also great for being able to quiet the mind and meditation isn't necessarily about not thinking, but being able to, um, 
have recoveries. So like your mind starts to wander, rein it back in and just rein it back in. Mind starts to wander, rein it back in. Uh, That's really what we're trying to do before a run, right? Oh, I'm getting nervous. Rein it back in. Starting to worry about this. Rein it back in. Mm -hmm, It was definitely practicing a good exercise to practice your mindset muscles for sure. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Hey, uh, so Jeffrey, do you have a question? I I was just going to say that I am a crazy run visualizer and like I probably visualize my run way too many times. (laughs) And like I, I'm, I often visualize my runs while I'm driving (laughs) and I will catch myself driving, clenching my jaw and holding my breath. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, that like, like, be- I'll, like yeah. I'll be in the middle of a run visualization and I'll be driving and then I'll just like, oh my God, I have to breathe. I'm not breathing. <laughs> yeah. Or, or I'll catch myself. Active driving charge. <laughs> yeah, or I'll like catch myself clenching my butt cheeks <laughs> or clenching my jaw. Like it's like, I get that into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like I before clench bed. my butt a lot. Uh-huh. When I- as I like get tight because I don't know what I'm I, I'm getting better at visualizing but I I feel like I'm okay in my head and then I feel my body's just like all clenched up and I have to remind myself to like relax because I know I'm gonna have to relax in real life <laughs> but I, I visualize myself being mm-hmm. relaxed so my body's actually not relaxed mm-hmm. yeah it's crazy at least you're mindful about it about, like the first step to changing something like that is actually just being aware of your thoughts or being aware of what's actually going on in your head. Cause that like, like you said earlier, Jeff, like sometimes you don't even remember getting to work cause you're just kind of zombie mode. Like you don't know. Cause I was too busy visualizing my run. (laughs) I don't remember the last 10 kilometers I drove. (laughs) So when that actually happens, Michelle, if you do a run and I guess it just comes back to like the anxiety aspect, but for being more in the moment and like the mindfulness to leading up and then actually doing the run is there anything you'd suggest for like because we're saying how we forget runs and I mean that comes down to us like being nervous but is there ways that will get us just more mindfully more present I would say the the biggest thing for that is to stay in your body like so to stay grounded energetically and I have the mantra ride the stride So for me, that means staying in the stride you're in, staying present. Mm -hmm. So it goes breathe deep, stay present and ride the stride. So that's for life, but also literally in the, in the run that you're riding the stride that you're in. You're not thinking about uh, your run across a second when you're just going in your, to your second barrel Mm -hmm. in, and it's, it's staying in the present moment. It's not thinking about what, the results of that run mean, whether it means you're going to win the average or whether it means you've made it to the one D or whether it means whatever you're riding right for your horse. That keeps me present. That's what I say to myself actually is like ride right for your horse. So whatever that is, what is that to me? It's staying present. It's being, it's staying soft in my body. It's staying soft in my hands. It's riding up deep into the turn, you know, like, so what it, whatever it is to you, ride right for your horse um but the grounding grounding and breath work really honestly are the two keys or so you're i will like literally literally i don't know if it's literal because there's not really roots Mm -hmm. but i will imagine roots growing out of my tailbone and out of my feet and into the earth and sometimes i'll actually use those roots to pull up focus so Mm -hmm. i'll be running up the running down the alley and i'll i'll think from using those roots to pull up focus but it's just an intention energy follows intention so whatever you need like you're plugging into that and you can connect oh we got a change of scenery <laughs> nice Jeff. you can plug in and connect to that whatever it is that you need through these roots mm-hmm. and you can like so energy follows imagination you want to send your nerves into the earth imagine that Mm -hmm. you want to plug in you want to stay grounded but the biggest thing I would say for remembering your runs is energetically you're staying in your body because what happens is like you're I've I've done this so I know the feeling but it's like you're all there and then if you're gone when you're in the arena 
or, and then you come out and it's like, oh, you grab your brain on the way past the post and then it's there and it's like, oh, what just happened? Does anybody know? <laughs> like, I don't even know. Where's yeah. my video? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Even though I still feel like, like I will, I feel like I'm a very present rider. I will think I know exactly what happened. And sometimes it does look a fair bit different on the video than what I thought happened. Yeah. That's why videos are also so good as well. Just yeah. for the improvements and being like, oh, that this is, you see what you didn't feel. And that yeah. can happen so quickly. So yeah. another thing that I wanted to touch on is if you did all the preparation, let's say you practiced all the beforehand stuff, you feel like you were ready and you find yourself in a rut. You are trying so hard to, you know, like I'm doing all the things Michelle Davy told me to, but I just, when I go out there, it's not coming together and you feel really discouraged. And how could someone just basically avoid that feeling and avoid being in that place? Well, I think what's kind of, you know, we've kind of gone full circle mm -hmm. to the beginning yep. of recognizing that you're enough no matter what your results say in the arena. They're, they are providing you with feedback, you know, like they're providing you with feedback that there's maybe some things you need to go and do. There may be some changes you need to make, but even the, you know, even the top rod, rod, top runners, riders, they don't win every time, right? Like, um, I was listening to an audio. It was talking about, um, baseball players, or even if you look at like bull riders, if you look at like the million dollar bull riders, they are like their buck off rate is over 50%. So half of the time they're in the dirt, but yet they won a million dollars. And here we're all upset because we had, you know, one bad run out of, well, you know, your, your example is more, it would be more than one bad run, but you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's our perspective. Like, and we start to want to make a good run all the time, mm -hmm. but that's not fair to ask of our horse, even or of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I going back to, you know, where I originally started with this was like when your sense of self and your enoughness is strong, it, it and also if your vibe, like your energetic vibe, if you can keep it up, and you're not relying on the results in the arena to keep your vibe high, your energy high. It's easier to not let the things that aren't going well for you affect you. Yeah. And you know, like you see a lot of people that rely on what happens on the weekends to have a happy life. Well, it's actually what goes on between Monday and Friday and how about what you feel about yourself mm -hmm. that is going to impact what happens on the weekend. Like you can, it's, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs if you only feel great about yourself when you win, exactly. like the, your sense of self, your enoughness, your self love is, you know, like a 365 days yeah. a year type of thing. It's not just feeling great about yourself when you won. Yeah. It's like that with anything, even like for someone's job, if they're not good enough because they don't have a good job or they don't do good at a race or any competition. And I guess it's just detaching your value and what you said. It's so true. Like, like the confidence I resonate a lot with and just if you're not just like that confident person and like that solid men mental like mentality of a person then when you go to a show it's not really going to change so I guess that is something that if you want to work on that you have to do it like you said 365 days a year <laughs> so. yeah, yeah it's a it's a journey like it's a uh, mental toughness mindfulness mindset work it's a journey. Like it's something that we can always improve on. I mean, mm -hmm. there, and it's kind of like, a, it life really, you could think of it as like a video game. Like you're constantly going up different levels. There's always different challenges. So otherwise, like if you just keep playing the same level over and over again, well, it gets kind of boring. Right. So that's why that's when we would, um, say, leave a jackpot and go to a rodeo or like a higher level of competition or a bigger event, you're challenging yourself. Well, then there's going to be some setbacks. You know, it's like if I'm going to amateur rodeos and I'm winning everything, well, that gets get, it's a little like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But if you're a person who likes to grow and develop themselves, you're going to then try and go to pro rodeos. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you've leveled up, but then there's going to be some challenges there that you may not have seen that around the corner right but that's what we love that's makes us feel good when we 
get through that level on that game type thing. Like you're going to try it once, you're going to try it twice and Oh, I figured it out. I know the trick. I'm going to do this now. Mm -hmm. So there, it, and I think that like thinking of life and brow racing like that as a game, I feel like it adds some perspective to like, um, to challenges mm -hmm. that they're, they're great. That just means there's something good on the other side of it. And like, um, going back to that frustration, if we don't look at it as like us sucking and we look at it, look at, look at it as a challenge to get through, you know, like just looking at things differently. Yeah. Like, Oh, because I didn't do good. It just means there's a possibility and there's something more to work towards. Yeah. Grow. There's something I need to tweak here. There's like another angle I need to come at this or mm -hmm. yeah. And like you said, I like that you analogy too, because thinking of, Oh yeah, I just have to, can tweak a few things and I can do better next time is that just like in a video game, you can do it over and over and over again until you get it. So it's not like you have one chance, like there's mm -hmm. maybe not this year, but there's another <laughs> barrel race coming. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was my mindset last year. It was just, I never got down my horse's first year, not turning first barrel. I was saying to Shelby before that I was like, okay, I'll just go back and do it again. And I think not only looking to, okay, there's another level after this, but that I can do this over and over until I get it right. And then I get to go forward again. Yeah, exactly. And it's once you like, and then that's the thing is, you know, what's on the other side and there's always yeah. something on the other side, like no matter what level you start like the amateur rodeo. And then you're like, there's going to be something on the other side. You do pro, you kind of might suck or you get a lot of obstacles, but there's something on the other side that you end up working towards, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, I think others? sometimes like we see others and their journey and it just looks like it's all just been smooth sailing for them. Mm -hmm. So we have this unrealistic, unrealistic expectation that we're just going to roll in and it's going to be all smooth sailing <laughs> for us. <laughs> but if I think if we are realistic to the sense that there, there may be some ups and downs and I might need to go around, you know, the, mm -hmm. the road to success does not look like this, right? It's like, <laughs> woo, 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 woo. Uh -huh. And I feel we forget that. And get into that comparison type thing that it looks so smooth for everyone else, but we don't see behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. To me, that has been the biggest struggle that I just, I think this last year really noticed is the comparison and how much it affected me as a trainer and a jockey and just in general to race is just looking at someone and being oh they have all this and then it immediately makes me degrade myself and then it goes to the confidence and then I go and I'm not confident and then it shows in my results you know and that's for me been a struggle but like you said if you just kind of realize you're not alone in it you know and everyone's in it together and sometimes it might look good but like you, everyone has their moments of good and bad. Yeah, for and sure. I think that's, that's ego. That's a human ego. That's normal to start comparing. Ego likes to make us feel alone and separate instead of seeing us all, uh, like not being an ego would be everyone as one, mm -hmm. that we are all connected, that we are all one. But it's tough because we are playing a game that feeds ego, which is ranking and comparing, right? Through winning. It's like, literally. <laughs> so it's a little bit challenging to be like completely mindful and completely Zen, but then be competitive at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to say that in a limiting sense that it's challenging, but just be aware that we're, you know, feeding ego by competing. Mm -hmm. Naturally. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have ego. So naturally it loves that. Mm -hmm. but like <laughs> but so it, how do you tackle it? Yeah. So, but I think it's just recognizing like that what's going on there. Like when you're upset, Oh, it's because ego thinks that it's just like naming that or meaning it, making it mean something to me, but it actually doesn't mean anything because it didn't change who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's good to like name that type of stuff? Like I've read that before where people actually name the feelings they get and it's like, stop it, Karen. Like, don't tell me that type of stuff. Like, do you think with like ego, it's the same sort of thing? Like, cause you said, oh, that's just ego talking and you kind of disassociate you with that feeling. Is that something? Hmm. 
That's a good question. I don't, well, I don't think I would name ego like as an alter ego, but you, you could. Mm -hmm. To me, that kind of gives it, it may empower it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I think it would be unrealistic to think that we're going to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. And it, like it can work in our favor also, right? Like sometimes ego is the voice in your head that gives you that competitiveness that makes you go and ride when you'd rather not, but you want to win. So you go and do and ride, go do it, go and ride. Yeah. So it, you can work with it. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, I talk about it kind of like get a better friend in your head. So we might get a better ego, like one that actually roots for you and cheers for you. Not one that cuts you down and tells you that you're not good enough. Right. So you can, I feel like you can train and I'm like pretending it's like sitting on my shoulder or something, but <laughs> You can train this friend in your head to work in your favor, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of be like, well, I see what you're doing there. I, and ego basically is trying to keep us safe. It doesn't want us to look stupid. It doesn't want us to look bad. So I see what it's doing, basically, right? Like, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. There's nothing to worry about. We're fine. <laughs> um, with that, I've, just, uh, I've looked at all the risks and I still want to go ahead with this. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Give me that high powered barrel horse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the other thing that I wanted to ask is if there's anyone that are trainers and jockeys. And since that is kind of a big bridge of a lot of people train their own horse. I think anyone that is running a horse, even if it was trained before, they're still technically a trainer every day when they ride it. So when you get to yeah. a race, is there ways that if you can kind of detach that where if someone's a really strong trainer, but they slack a bit in the jockey department, is there are ways that, like you could just it's a touch it's such a mental aspect of switching from trainer to jockey. So what would you maybe say at a race to go from one or the other? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's definitely a struggle that a lot of people have. You did say one thing that I think is true is that it is a, a mindset basically. And I would be careful of where we might limit ourselves, where we are declaring, mm -hmm. I'm not a very good jockey. Right. That we've like, so then you've said that. So what you speak, you become right. Mm -hmm. So I would be careful of that. But what I have found is that a lot of people who have trouble going from trainer to jockey mode are the people who are also perfectionists. Mm -hmm. And it's that they, they are having a hard time being taking a chance that they might be imperfect. Like perfectionism, I believe, is a fear of imperfection. So a fear of being imperfect. So if you're so worried about not having a perfect run, that's going to hold you back, right? It's going to have you, um, yeah, it's going to have you pumping the brakes <laughs> because you want it to be perfect, and you're going to man, not necessarily manhandle. That might not be the right word to say, but like you're going to micromanage. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. You're going to micromanage your horse, which is going to be slow. Mm -hmm. like horses are not going to feel like to me barrel racing is kind of like um the rider feeling like they're in control but the horse feeling like they're free right like you want your horse to feel like they can run with the edge and be free mm -hmm. but we also don't like feeling like we're out of control so it's like that fine line right of finding that balance um i do think it depends on the level of training your horse is at. Like I do see a lot of people who jockey up when their horse isn't actually ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes people do ask their horse to win before they're ready to win. And I feel like it should be a, uh, not necessarily slow, but steady build up of confidence where you test your work, then you go back and then you test your work again. But most people who feel like they're not good jockeys are the people that maybe don't test their work mm -hmm. enough or trust their work enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And they stay slow for too long. And then all of a sudden their horse just thinks that's what they are going to do. Mm -hmm. And actually the horse I'm running now, she really challenged me because she came on so fast to allow her to try and go a little faster, try and little go, go a little faster in the past. I wouldn't have taken the chances I did on her, but I like to, to build up that fast, mm -hmm. but I, it's all about knowing your horse. And I think about, um, knowing your training, 
that you have to fall back on. So it's like, you know, when I said, I'm, I know the risks and I'm willing to take them. Mm-hmm. Well, so I would think because I'm a recovering perfectionist. So I definitely associate with people who have trouble putting this jockey hat on and it is very much outside of my comfort zone, but I know that I can put on that hat, step into the energy of a jockey is what I do. Okay. It's like, this is what, the, this is what it looks like. This is what I'm going to have to show up like. And I have to energetically think about embodying that person because it's so not me naturally. Mm-hmm. It's like my alter ego in the arena kind of thing, right? It's like, who, it's so, and if I'm in a, like a small pen, I think you guys call them barns. We call them indoor arenas, <laughs> 13 second pattern. That is outside of my comfort zone because the level of energy you have to have for that to get your horse like by the barrels is so much higher than where I normally operate at. Um, but you can do it. You like, you just, you have to step into the energy of that. And then after it's over, it's like, that was so outside of my natural habitat. <laughs> right? right. Um, I feel like I've gone, I've gone down a turkey trail here where we started. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh wait, shoot, shoot, shoot. I muted. There we go. Okay, sorry. I'm all muted. No, you're so good. So if you're going to take that chance and, and you're going to jockey up, mm-hmm. you, need to, you need to also know that if this goes south, like if this, if the wheels fall off the bus, when I try and go for it, can I put things back together? Mm-hmm. If it's a yes, like, yeah, my horse has a good foundation. It's only, we're only ha- going to have to walk through the pattern a couple times and we're good to go, mm-hmm. well, then take the risk, right? But if you have a horse that's mentally fragile and if the wheels fall off the bus, you're like two months that you have to put this horse back together, well, then you're going to take slower steps, right? Like what you're going to ask for when you jockey up is going to be a little bit different depending on what you ride. But I see a lot of people asking horses to win when they're not ready to win. Mm-hmm. And in times where you don't need the horse to give a hundred percent to win either. It's true. It's also about managing that energy. You know, when you talked about bringing your energy up or mm-hmm. it's like, I call it your ideal performance state. So it's finding your ideal performance state for that horse, for that arena. Cause it's going to change like d- based on the footing, even like of how fast your footing in is, is going to depend on how much you're going to bring it or bring it down, right? Bring it up or bring it down. So there's lots of things to consider when you're getting yourself into your ideal performance state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I love all, like, that's just so accurate. Like trying to, it, like what you said at first, cause I'm definitely a perfectionist. Like I've trained all the horses I've run and I've know that's been my struggle of switching it off, going to just draw, like, let's test it. And that's what I heard recently as well. It's like at a show you're testing, at home you're preparing for the test and then if you think of it like that then you're like you know you just kind of I guess let it happen more how it's going to happen instead of me wanting to micromanage like you said and yeah that's actually some really good points that you just mentioned so I think like oftentimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for the good work that we're doing like it's like we're not test trusting ourselves to take the test basically Mm -hmm. right Yeah. yeah And it's just like an ongoing battle with yourself because then things don't go how you want. And you're like, well, what, what am I doing wrong? I'm doing all the training, right? But it's like, it doesn't have to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Or, or another thing that people often do is like, so you tested your work mm-hmm. and first barrel, they stepped off a of first barrel and they had a great second and a great third. You come out and you're like, I shouldn't have trusted her at first. And you forget all about that awesome second and that, and that awesome third. Mm-hmm. All you need to go home is work is go home and do is work on the first. You've got the second and third, but it's human nature to go to the negative first. And I try and encourage people as soon as they come out, two good things, two good things, find the two good things. And then you're not finding the bad thing, but you're going to find the thing that you're going to go home and work on this week. Mm-hmm. We, sometimes it's like, you got to make the run. So you know what you can go home and work on. Cause otherwise you don't really have a plan. You're just, uh-huh. once your horse is broke, then you have to test your work. Otherwise you're just, you're unsure. Yeah. You're just taking yeah. on them without a purpose. <laughs> uh huh. That's how I feel right now. Cause I have a four-year-old that I was going to run 
which I already started running at just winter jackpots, but now I'm at home and I'm like, I'm not even running her. So I don't know those areas I need to come back to and work with, which is a bigger struggle than I thought it would be. <laughs> like you need those tests. And like that kind of comes back to the whole thing of if you don't do good, you kind of need to not do good to figure out, okay, how, like, what do I need to work on? Where are my gaps? Yeah. Right? And they're yeah. not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, like the same thing as like that first run back in the spring, you got your horse legged up, you did all your slow work, you're good. You got to make that run. So you know what to do next. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It keeps it, keeps the train going and mm -hmm. just kind of, yeah, like your whole season. That's what's been hard. Have you noticed with any of your clients and stuff, them struggling with keeping riding or keeping even motivated right now to ride? Yeah. Yes, definitely losing their mojo. And part of that I think is a so because a lot of people ride because they're competing mm -hmm. because of their love of competition. And actually my, I think it was last week's podcast. So my podcast, the rider's mind, the topic was why you ride, like what, what was it? Finding the why in your ride or something like that. I can't think of the title, mm -hmm. but it was just kind of a look at thinking about why do you ride? And because people are losing their mojos and going back to that love of your horse, going back to the love of um, seeing young horses progress, right? And like, you know, the two and three-year-old, maybe not necessarily the ones that are run, running, but going back and spending that time with your horse where you just be and b thinking of it as partnership building, a time for partnership building, which we don't normally, you know, your your intention is to fix what happened at the last jackpot to leg them up, to build their air. Like you have all these intentions and very rarely do we have becoming a strong partner with a friend. That's just something that, or with our horse, that's just something that seems to happen by default, mm -hmm. not something that is intentional, not something we can do now, right? With yeah. this time is to actually mm -hmm. really have a strong bond because I think that is something that I can see that I pick up on when I watch barrel racings is the horses that maybe aren't, the best athlete but they're an awesome partner to their rider and they end up in the top because of that partnership and that level of trust between horse and rider is there mm -hmm. and the horse will just walk through fire for that rider so as long as the rider rider's got her head on straight it just it just happens mm -hmm. as opposed to you might have a horse that's got all the talent and all the papers to get it done but if the horse is not feeling like a partner <laughs> they're just not connected they're not connected and they're you can you can see that and i mean it shows up in tenths of a second and they all add up right every tenth of that disconnection in a run mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that's true kind of brings you back like it reminds me of just like when you're kids why did you do it initially what did you fall in love with and now like myself when you just said that it's like yeah you have all these things you have to accomplish and you just lose sight and then when you lose all those things you have to accomplish, you're like, wait, what do I even have now? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. or, yeah, just getting a good bond with them. Yeah. That's so true. Going back to, you know, what, what, what would I do if I was eight years old or what would I do if I was 10 years old right now with this horse? Like, mm -hmm. and let that be enough. <laughs> like yeah. it, it'll go a long ways. Yeah, like get on bareback or something. <laughs> I started doing that. Oh, it's did you? Cool. Good. Yeah, I haven't ridden bareback in probably 10 years at least. I can't remember how old I was last time I rode bareback. And it's hard. Yeah, but it's <laughs> good for your balance. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. My horse is not easy and slow and like chill. She's like always go, go, go. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't fall off to be honest. <laughs> humbling, humbling, right? When you're doing the, I know. I know I'm like, Oh my God, I thought I was a good rider. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, was, did anyone else have anything they wanted to share with Michelle or any questions they had for her? I think I've muted everyone, but if you want to unmute yourself or ask a question, now is your chance. <laughs> But um, let me see. So I think I pretty much covered all my main questions that I had from everybody. Um, I just want to thank you again, Michelle, for joining. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? If you want to do a shout out of your podcast and just tell people where they can find you. 
Yeah, for sure. So my podcast is called The Writer's Mind. Uh, it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, I have a Facebook page under my name, Michelle Davy, and Instagram the same. Okay, I'll take you in because uh, I'm like I said, I'm gonna post some of this, any of the okay. good stuff we have, and then I'll take you in it so everyone that sees it will be able to find you there. So yeah, well, I think this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so Great much. Question. Thank you so much. I love your podcast.